Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. In this episode, I welcome realtor Nate Getzels, and we started talking about generational wealth. What is generational wealth? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Generational wealth refers to any kind of asset that family passes down to their children, grandchildren, loved ones, whether in the form of cash, investment funds, stocks and bonds, properties, or even an entire company. Most generational wealth is passed down as inheritance with the vast majority of Americans inheriting just under $50,000. Ever hear of the term trust fund baby? A trust fund baby is a person, typically a younger adult, who is independently wealthy and does not need to work to earn a living. The wealth that was created before the trust fund baby is generational wealth. Wealth passed down from one generation to the next. But why is any of this important? Generational wealth gives an individual more opportunities in life, but generational wealth also is tied directly to wealth inequality. Let's take a race of 100 people, for example. Now, this example can be found on YouTube. First, we will start each individual at the starting line. However, we will ask a series of questions before the race. If you answer yes to any of these questions, you may take two steps forward before the race begins. Okay, here are some of the questions. If you had access to a free tutor, take two steps forward. If you attended a private school, take two steps forward. If you had high-speed internet at home, take two steps forward. If you didn't have to pay for college, take two steps forward. If you never had to wonder where your next meal was going to come from, take two steps forward. Now, as the race begins, some individuals may not be able to take a step forward. That's life. Those opportunities, some created by generational wealth, help individuals be able to take two steps forward before the race even begins. In 2019, white families had a conditional medium expected inheritance of about $195,000. Meanwhile, Hispanic families expected a medium inheritance of about $150,000, while black and other families looked forward to about $100,000. However, only 10.1% of black families and 7.2% of Hispanic families actually received an inheritance, while that figure is notably higher, about 29.9% among white households per fertility. I am all about entrepreneurism, but is it important to note that Mark Zuckerberg got a $100,000 cash injection from his father, Jeff Bezos' parents were his investors in Amazon, and Elon Musk was born into a wealthy South African family. But this is also why an entrepreneur should care. Generational wealth gives family members the financial ability to secure their family's future. Going back to the example above, take two steps forward if you didn't have to pay for your cell phone bill, your car bill, or health insurance, or have to worry about the next meal would come from. Those are created at times through generational wealth and have also created inequalities. As the old saying goes, you have to have money to make money. But how? How can we create generational wealth starting from zero? Well, it starts with the plan. First, understand where you stand financially. Tackling personal debt, saving money, or pursuing other financial goals like starting a business are okay too, but they are not always creators of generational wealth. A few examples of generational wealth are investing in the stock market where there is the potential for continued growth for decades, having a general understanding of stock market sectors, stocks versus bonds versus crypto, and risk are important. I'm not a financial advisor and I would highly recommend you seek one out. Investing in real estate is another way to create generational wealth. Well-placed rental properties can be consistent source of cash flow and the value of the property may increase throughout the years. Build and pass down a business. That is what I'm here to help you to do. Builders build. Walmart is a family-owned business and has since 1962. BMW, Dell, Comcast, Estee Lauder Dell, they are all family businesses. Life insurance, take advantage of it. Talk to a professional about it. Establish college saving funds for the kids. Student loans is setting generations back. Help your children by setting up college saving plan like a 529 plan, which is also a tax write-off. Again, talk to a professional about it. And teach these kids personal finance. Help them understand credit cards, loan, interest rates, everything that you wish you knew as a kid. Help your kids. Lastly, create an estate plan or a will. Consult with an attorney. Generational wealth is an important to understand and leverage. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. 
where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. the founder of the Getzel Group, Nate Getzel. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with a luxury real estate agent. I'm really excited about this one because we actually already started. Nathaniel Getzels. How are we doing, boss? I'm great. How are you? Uh, I'm excited. I'm we, we, we've been chatting. We were we starting talking about things after the show. So, but first, let's oh, yeah. let's introduce the world to Nate. Nate, give him give him a little background. Tell him who you are, where you're coming from. Let the listeners know who Nate is. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, I am a real estate. I have a real estate team here. It's now part of Compass um, here in Calabasas. So beautiful Calabasas, California. Um, and, you know, I, I started in real estate about 12 and a half years ago or so. Um, and I did that because, you know, I, I'd been a teacher and everything that I did um, had to do with, and everything I still do has to do with what can I bring to the table? What can I add to the conversation? What can I add to the interaction? So, you know, like a lot of business people, they go to all these events and they think, okay, I'm going to go network. Let's see what I can get. Let's see what I can get. Well, I have a completely different mindset. It's what can I bring? What can I add? How can we build? What can we build? How can we collaborate? Right? Uh, what, What value can I bring? So I've taught in every level of school from preschool administrator up through college, been a behavior therapist and all these things in education. And I was finishing my master's, finishing my, my thesis. And I went, you know, this all sucks. It sounds horrible. Uh, number one, I, I realized that everything from the fundamental base of our education system is wrong. And it teaches everything that is literally the antithesis, the antithesis of entrepreneurialism. Right. So they teach you um, to work hard. That's wrong. You should work smart. Right. They teach you to um, get a good job and get a good salary. That's wrong. You should be building wealth. Uh, They teach you to get out of debt. That's wrong. You should be leveraging your debt. And they teach you not to copy or pay attention to what your peers are doing, which is also wrong. Uh, We don't need to recreate the wheel. We just need to help it spin a little better. So what we should be doing is looking at what everybody's doing and figuring out how to collaborate or do it with them or, you know, uh, um, uh, work together to make what they're doing even better. So literally everything from the education system is opposing to if you want to be an entrepreneur. So I couldn't in good mental health, A, stay in that system. B, there was no money to be had in that system realistically. So if there's no money and you don't believe in the system, then why am I there, right? It it just seemed like a punishment. So what I did is I looked at all the things that um, I loved, right? So my dirty little secret in the middle of the night, I'd look around, no one was looking. I'd pop open my computer And I would start searching and I'd find the most beautiful, sexy houses you could imagine all over Zillow. I'd be all over that. Oh, do it all the time. That used to be my jam. Man, I love that. That's when Zillow just came out. You know, it was like, "Mm, please. I didn't want anyone to know. And I was like, okay, let's go. Love it. And then, you know, 
and I studied where people live, where, where they move to, why they move, when they move. And another like little nerdy desire and love of mine is, um, learning about how cities grow and why they grow and, you know, how they became the way they are now. So I did that. I already studied the trends of real estate as well, because I think that's fascinating. Um, looked at houses, loved houses. Uh, so I went, okay, well, I still want to help people though. So I want to help people grow. And so for most people, um, real estate still the largest financial investment they're ever going to make. And if they do it correctly, they will set up their family for literally generations to come of having uh, generational wealth. And so I thought, well, there's no way I can help people better than that because uh, financial stability creates all kinds of opportunities that most families never get to enjoy. So that, and even my clients where it's not their largest purchase, because strangely enough, I have several of those. Um, it's still an important financial wealth building tool for them. So I'm still able to help guide and, and, and assist there. So I wanted to combine all of those things into something that, you know, was a business because I wanted to own my own business. And obviously while everybody says you do it for the passion, that's great. And that's true. But I'm most passionate about laying on the beach with a margarita <laughs> in my hand. So if I didn't need money, I, that's what I'd be doing. So, you know, this is a great mix of, of yeah. all the things that I love. And I actually really do get excited about, you know, a lot of aspects. And now I'm being added to all these different boards and advisorships that are within the sphere, which is really, really interesting and exciting. So I literally dropped what I was doing. And it's one of those things where you make a decision in a short amount of time, but it's a life-changing decision. It literally changes every single thing about your life. Uh, the only thing that it's even similar to is like, if you decide to have a kid or not have a kid, it's like that decision, the decision time that you took might only have been a short amount of time. It might not even have been that well thought out, but there was thought put into it but it changes absolutely everything. Yeah. So I literally dove headfirst in 2010, you know, which was the last huge crash. We were still in the last big crash. Um, when everyone was running in the streets saying, get out of real estate, get away, you know, real estate's dead. It's the end of the world, et cetera, et cetera. That's when I was like, well, that's, that's the logical thing to do. I'm going to go straight for where everybody's running from. And I figured if I could make it, then I could make it anytime. And that was 12 years ago and never looked back. Now, you mentioned you were a teacher. What what did you use to teach? Oh, I taught everything. I've taught, let's see, I taught science. I taught um, teachers how to build their curriculum. I taught, um, I worked for a short amount of time when I was getting certified as a preschool administrator in a preschool. In college, I taught human sexuality, marriage and family relations, um, all kinds of things. I mean, and I worked as a behavior therapist for children with um, autism and other disabilities, which actually taught me certain things that I still think back to today. Uh, like for when you have a learning disability, it, it, it's usually a perceptive difference. So you're perceiving the world differently, right? So the regular stimuli are either amplified or dulled, or there's something very different about them, right? So the world can be a very scary place very quickly and overwhelming. So one of the things that I found, and really the, the key thing is, um, I had to attune with my students. So that way, when an experience was becoming overwhelming or uh, scary or too much to handle, if I had built that, that, relationship right and attuned with my student they knew they could look at me and I could be a trusted source for them to they could kind of look at it and check back am I okay am I not okay you know um and that's something I still do today even with my clients and the people I work with and the other agents I work with I mean you know Chris Voss calls it uh tactical empathy Mark Goldston calls it listening in um, some people call it feeling the flow. Uh, one of my favorite clients, he calls it feeling the vibe, 
you know, so, it, but really it's, it's building that connection, right? Which if you establish an emotional, psychological and, and, and somewhat intellectually based connection with anybody, but especially these students, uh, there's that higher level of trust. So when things get tough, right? Like if you're in a deal with somebody and it's not going well, or they have a challenge with their house or a challenge with their finances or whatever it is, if that trust is built, then you become a resource and that relationship becomes kind of like your currency versus if you haven't and you're a replaceable commodity, right? So, so that was a very important um, thing that I learned during my educational journey, right? Nice. And, and there's many things that I've gotten to, to pull over, but that one directly, I think I use every day. And, and I remember the moment that I understood how important it was. And I've never forgotten that. Nice. I don't know if that was your question, but now, now, now why you, you're, you know, you kind of mentioned you're starting the education and you're went into real estate. Why did you run into real estate when everybody was running away? Well, I looked at all the things that I was passionate about, right? And I know not only passionate, but it's it's a operational passion, right? Because if you're just doing things that are passionate, it's like you're drunk and you don't make the best choices. But if you take what you're passionate about and then create a system to it or an operation and lot and you, you do so in logic, then it's something amazing, powerful, and special. Without the logic or without the passion, you're gonna have a real problem on either one of those sides, but you, you tied the two together. Now you have something special. So I, I looked at all the things that I was passionate about, which was helping people, real estate, um, studying the trends, helping people move, understanding where people move. And I put it all together. And the only logical thing that I could see myself doing was real estate at that point. And so, you know, uh, like Warren Buffett always says, you want to go towards where everybody's running from. So that also, it was perfect timing because everybody was running from it at the time. Uh, and I thought, well, there's, I still could see the value there, right? There's still real value. And I don't know why D&D &D didn't turn on. That's weird. Do not disturb is Oops. already on. Sorry about that. That's fine. Um, so... Um, but so I went straight for it because it was all the things, right? It was everything I was passionate about. Plus it was where everybody was running from. So there was real opportunity there. And also there's less competition. And I figured if I could make it then I could make it anytime. And so it was a sink or swim. And I figured if I could swim, then I'll rise with the tide and I'll learn and I'll be dangerous, be more dangerous than, uh, than if I had started any other time, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, what what is your company's name currently? And do we have any staff that work under you? Yeah, so I have a team, um, which is called Getzel's Group. And it's actually now part of Compass Real Estate here in Calabasas. And I do have agents on my team that work for me. And yeah. I help them because the whole idea, a lot of teams, the uh, agents become kind of glorified assistants, or are very dependent on the um, the team member, like the the team leader. And my whole idea is to, if I can educate them correctly, they can become super agents on their own, and just sew in with my experience and the tools that I've built and my social media following and my my social media tools that I custom built over the last twelve years, uh, and also all the other great things that I've brought together, and you know, maybe their journey is a little easier, but they can become a super agent and, you know, build wealth and be happy, you know, but sewn in to an already established framework. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Now, how do you, so for example, when you're looking for an agent, what do you, what do you look for? Well, you know, funny enough, I don't really look for agents. Um, they find me, they find me constantly and I more have to uh, filter than anything. So the first thing we do is we have to, I ask uh, anyone who's interested, send me a resume, an application letter that they write, and then read a couple of books about real estate. 
uh, and then we discuss what resonates in those books. And then uh, we have a pretty detailed um, uh, application, not application, but interview process. And then uh, it usually culminates with them at me asking the question, what are you bringing to the table? Right? Because when I started, I thought, oh, I need to convince people why this is such a great team, why they need to come here and, and work with me. And then I realized, no, first of all, you're hitting the wrong people. And secondly, I don't need to convince anyone. If I need to convince you, you're in the wrong place. Right? So figuring out, because also it helps them to realize what they need to do to, to succeed. Right? Because uh, we're, we're, you know, we're 12 years in. We're not, we're not holding people's hands. We're giving tools, but you know, uh, we're not we're not here to baby you. So if you want to come, think about what value you bring and maximize that value. And if you want help maximizing that value, great. But if you are, don't initially know what you have to offer, you need to go back to the drawing board and do some deep thought. That makes sense. Yeah. Now, what what tools? What kind of what kind of things do you can you provide or maybe some nuggets that maybe some you know brokers are listening or agents are listening what are some things that they should know about the the real estate game yeah so it's a combination of things uh there there's a combination of executable items and a mindset right so the first thing is like the first thing that that a lot of even seasoned agents still don't get is uh you should be falling in love with the process not falling in love with the deal, right? So don't, don't focus on a specific deal, uh, worrying about too much if it closes or how it goes. I mean, you want to know how it goes, but you want to fall in love with the process because then if you perfect that process, you can do another 10 deals, 15 deals, 100 deals with the right system. But if you're falling in love or, or obsessing over one deal, you're, uh, basically tripping over dollars to pick up pennies at that point. Right. So, so there's a mindset that has to do with it. And, and I always like to explain that the big difference between high producers and low producers is pretty simple. And it's that the, the high producers uh, hate failing, but the low producers fear failing. And when you fear something, you run from it. But when you hate something, you you know it's going to happen, but you do everything you possibly can to avoid it from happening, but you accept it as an inevitability. And you just, when it happens, you use it to propel yourself forwards and perfect your skill for the next time to, 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 to delay the next time it happens. But, you know, failing isn't a bad thing. I, uh, I, gotta t- I always tell people you want to fail often and fail fast right? Fail fast and fail often because it gets you closer to the win. So that's, that's one thing. And then there's all these executable items. We have a great CRM system that has AI um, sewn into it. I mean, one of the reasons uh, I, I have my team here at Compass is they have the best tech tools, in my opinion, of any other brokerage. So the basic tools are great. And then we build on top of those with our own expertise and our own uh, um, assets that we've built over the years. So that's a big thing, uh, but consistency, consistently doing what works. So everybody asks me, oh, what's the most effective marketing? Is it, is it your insane uh, social media platform that you've built over the last few years you're following and, and all the things you do? Is it email? Is it calling? Is it texting? Is it your sphere? What's the best? And I always explain to people, it's the best thing is the thing that you do and the thing you do consistently. And that's going to be your success in any business. The most effective thing is the thing you do and the thing you do consistently and regularly and perfect every day. Right. So, you know, the, the, like I, and I do a lot on social media, but it's because I do it consistently and regularly and I generate a lot of business. In fact, 12 years ago, I started my business at the time that the market was kind of in shambles and I was from a very different standpoint. A lot of people come to real estate from a standpoint, a background of finance, a background of numbers, of math, of something transactional, right? I came from it from a human development standpoint. So 
I built my whole business at the time through Facebook actually and social media, which was really just Facebook back then. Um, because I found I was organically almost accidentally connecting with people and I had plenty of time and no money. So I built the whole platform through that and started generating a lot of deals. And, you know, a few years later kind of organized real estate and, and agents figured out, Hey, this is where you need to be. But you know, I had to do what resonated with me. The same reason I went into real estate is the reason that I marketed uniquely because I had to do what resonates with me. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? If you're faking it, that's going to come through. People are going to feel it and they're not going to want to attune and connect and work with you because who wants to work with a fake? It doesn't, it's not authentic. You have to be authentic and organic and creating authentic organic relationships is really the core of the business right it's the core of most businesses where you're in essence you're a service because i don't own the houses i'm selling right my clients own the houses but i don't own the houses i don't you know i never take ownership of anything really i'm a service so you have to build the relationship to properly provide the service so creating authentic organic relationships with your clients and with your sphere and with your friends allows you to uh, establish authority. It allows you to achieve, if you do it right, top of mind awareness about a specific subject, in this case, real estate. And it allows you to become the resource and the, the trusted source when anybody needs or thinks about that subject, you pop into their mind, yeah. right? I just had a call from someone the other day who says, oh, so-and-so just referred to you um, you know, we were talking about real estate and your name basically blurted out your name almost out of reflex because you're the guy for him for real estate. And this is somebody who, I mean, I've been friends with for years, but do I see regularly? No. Have I talked to? No. Have I done a transaction with recently? No. But I achieved that top of mind awareness. So whenever he has somebody, he automatically shoots them over. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Now, how... How difficult was it for you to kind of transition from being in the educational world to then in the real estate world? Well, I mean, every transition, hard things are worth doing, right? So it was completely different, but luckily I had some skills, some unique skills that allowed me to create deep, meaningful relationships with people that over time grew and has now allowed me to create a very unique uh, client base of CEOs, celebrities, musicians. I mean, you name it, I've probably worked with them, billionaires from around the world. Like it, it's, it's a very interesting set of clients that, that I have. It's everything. I mean, I still sell inexpensive properties as well, but the focus is the high end. And so it was difficult, but worth it. Right. Um, I think in stoicism, they talk about you want to do as many difficult things up front. Basically, this is a paraphrase, but so that way, when you get to truly hard challenges, you're ready and prepared and you're strong enough for them. So, you know, it was a lot of repositioning, understanding uh, how to use skills I had and convert them to new, new situations. Um, it was not easy. Real estate is a very hard business to be in, get into, stay in. That's something that, you know, you never see, like, but you see all these TV shows, it makes it look very glamorous, very easy, very wild, but none of that's real. And none of that's even the stuff people should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Anyway, most of it is not all that sexy, but it's valuable. Yeah, definitely. Now, what, what, what would, what would you say has been easy? Has there anything um, been easy? Well, easy is an interesting term. I'd say once you realize that creating the relationships is important, um, say it's fun. I don't know if I'd say it was easy, but creating new ways to do that. Like, for example, I have a company, Podcast Cola, that books me on a bunch of podcasts. And it's literally the best way to authentically, organically connect with your uh, clients and, and future clients and other people and large groups, but in a real way that really is you, right? So that's fun. 
like this being on your show is fun. This is great, right? You're wonderful. Like this is, I'm having a ball, right? But was it easy? Hmm. I mean, being on a series of them, it's not like what you do, your, your podcast, you, how often do you do it? Once a week, Aaron, once, once a week. week. Okay. And would you say that's easy? Oh, Jesus. No. Cause then you have all right. the marketing, you have all the newsletters, the websites. Oh yeah. There's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of behind the scenes. But you enjoy it, right? I enjoy it. Yeah, it's fun. Yes. So I would say um, I don't have that many things that are necessarily easy because I feel like easy things aren't worth doing in general. Good point. Right? Hard things are great because the best things you do and the most productive and the most rewarding are hard. Yeah. But you get a lot out of them. Yeah. So I feel like if something's too easy, I'm probably not doing it right. Yeah. You know, you know one of the things you're mentioning too um, you, your social media presence and, and what you've been doing and kind of how, how do you market yourself? How do you brand yourself? How would you go from being, you know, just being in real estate for 12 years to now working with, as you mentioned, billion dollar homes? Right. Well, I mean, the, the social media part was a big, a big aspect. And, you know, I started and you didn't need any money and it was, I wouldn't say that was easy, but it was easier than it is now. That's for sure. Uh, now social media has become much more challenging and I had to do it, start doing it wrong for a while to figure out how to do it right again. Right. And so I kind of feel like social media, it's like this chart where I'm like, I did it great. Now, not so good. Now, great. <laughs> now, not so good. And not, not because the core things are, are changed. I mean, the core things are, you want to be authentic. You have to be organic. You have to be real and you have to be social. But now, uh, strangely enough, you have to be more social and less polished than ever. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, for in fact, for a while, I was doing these gorgeous, gorgeous videos. I mean, we had three cameras. We had lighting. We had the makeup <laughs> guy. We had, you know, sets. We had Love it. costumes. We had everything. And it looked so gorgeous. And we started pumping out these videos and just nobody cared. <laughs> like, at all. Man. And I mean, we had scripts, we had like, I mean, literally I'd be sitting at a camera where there was 12 people like running around adjusting digital. And what I realized is that doesn't work anymore in real estate, in, in, in social media, because it's supposed to be social. It's supposed to be real. The reason that TikTok is one of the fastest growing social media um, uh, platforms is because it's the least polished. Yeah. Right now I still do two edited videos a week every week on my Instagram and a few other platforms. And I do photos and I do five stories a day. I mean, there's a formula to the way I do the, the, the social media stuff, but it's much more authentic, organic. It's one camera. It's just me. There's no makeup guy. There's no lighting guy. There's just me and the camera basically. Yeah. And then it's a little bit edited because otherwise totally. you know, nobody wants to see me dribble on for an hour, but <laughs> you know, uh, so my guy, he takes what I organically I'm saying and just chops it up a little bit. So I, I sound elegant. I like it. Now, what, yeah. what, what motivates you? What continues, what gets you up every day and continues to push you forward? Well, the ability and the possibility of helping more people, uh, helping people build wealth. Um, you know, I also am an advisor on several companies. And I was just avid as the uh, board of directors for a company called Houselet. Houselet. It's, uh, it's basically like a, simplized, a, a simplified version is uh, Zillow and um, Airbnb had a really pretty baby, like a really pretty baby. And it's basically a simple few click solution to doing rentals. Uh, largely it's, it focuses on 30 to 90 day, um, furnished rentals, but you could rent long-term on there. You could rent shorter term, whatever it is, but it, it's, it's a really beautiful platform and that's fun and interesting. And, you know, it, it's, there's new challenges in that, but it's still in the real estate space, but it's, it's a new company. It's a new challenge, right? So that's kind of fun and yeah. interesting. It just makes my brain grow. I love doing things that make my brain grow and help people at the same time, right? So yeah. I still love selling homes and helping people buy and sell properties and helping my agents grow their business um, because it's fun and interesting and it, it like 
makes my brain grow. But I also love these new projects because they're fun and interesting, right? So in essence, I love doing fun, interesting things with good people. Nice. That's really the core of it. And luckily, I was able to figure out a business where I could do that a lot of a lot of time. Nice. A lot of the time. Now let's so, let's let's flip it around. What yeah. what keeps you up at night as a as a business owner? Um scaling faster, growing more, helping more people. Uh, you know, I'm I've invested in properties all around the world. And, you know, some of them the projects at different times a day, uh, trying to perfect some of the projects that I'm working on, the businesses that aren't necessarily launched and going as well as some of the other ones, right? Uh, because I'm always trying to do new things and grow. And a big part of it is not being scared of failing. So I do a lot of stuff wrong, right? I do. And, and I feel like that's a strength because when you're okay with doing things wrong, you open up a whole new potential for growth and learning. Mm. You don't do, I learn way more from the things I do wrong than things I do right. So the things I'm doing wrong or, or the, the, the pain points in different businesses and different growth points, or, you know, how I can do social media even better or how I can help people more or how I can create more wealth for my family. Right. Those are the things that keep me up at night for sure. What, what are things, like, uh, are those good examples? Do you have a better example? No, you? those are great. Great. In fact, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned, um, you know, we learn from our mistakes, right? Right. Uh, what, what would you say are the most common mistakes as, you know, speaking from a real estate perspective, what are some common mistakes like us as buyers? I'm a buyer. I'm not a real estate agent or a broker. What are some mm-hmm. common mistakes you see us as buyers make and that we can probably learn from? Oh, there's quite a few. Uh, so the first one is, you really, people think they can do it on their own, right? And um, it's kind of like anything, right? Can you sort of maybe do part of it on your own or, or think you can do it on your own and then get yourself in trouble and then go for help? Sure. But if you go, if you've been building the knowledge up front, you will do it better. You will save more money and you will have what you want faster and you will be happier with the process and you'll learn more. Right. So the first thing I, I have a lot of buyers call me and they're like, well, you know, they, they, they are out of order with the process or they get themselves in trouble with a deal or they waste a lot of time and energy or they cost themselves a lot of money because they think they could do it themselves. And I know that sounds kind of selfish and self-serving in a way, but statistically I'm right. And functionally after 12 years, like, when I started and people were like, oh, well, you have to talk to a realtor up front. You want an expert in the field. I thought it's kind of hokey, right? <laughs> yeah. Sounds, sounds kind of self-serving. Like I see all these videos online of people, get a realtor, get a realtor, get a realtor. Yep. yep. Uh, you know, a lot of it doesn't resonate because a lot of it is self-serving. But realistically, buyers need to get, build a strong team up front. And that means have a good realtor, have a good lender, right? Those key things up front are so important because the lender will help you with your finances and you should really be talking to a lender six months to a year before you're ready to buy. That's, that's what I tell everyone. Six months to a year before you're ready to buy, you need to talk to a lender. Even before you talk to an agent, you need to get your finances in line. Right. And that's the first thing I see people not do is they don't get, they don't understand the importance of getting their finances set up way ahead of time. Yeah. Good point. And you can save tens of thousands of dollars by doing this and it doesn't cost you anything. So there's that. Then either not getting a realtor or just trying to save money on that side, right? That's literally tripping over pennies to pick up dollars. I mean, sorry, tripping over dollars to pick up pennies because you're going to get what you pay for. So if you get an experienced, good agent who you authentically, organically uh, vibe or, or tune with, right? Who you feel listens providing you value, you're going to be in a much stronger place than you don't. And you're going to be getting better advice. You're going to be getting better guidance, right? Because in essence, this is a white glove service. So if you don't have someone who has good white gloves or giving you good service, you're, you're already cooked, yeah. as they say, right? Point. So you need to build a really good team up front 
And part of having a good, getting good guidance is really figuring out what you want. And so one of the things like millennials, for example, and first time home buyers in general, the biggest complaint, the biggest complaint in the first two years is, wow, I never thought about how much this house costs to maintain. So there's a lot of focus put on your mortgage payment, right? Your interest that you're paying, your down payment. But a lot of buyers never think past that. And I had a woman, she sold her house because she goes, I'm selling my house. I'm like, okay, but, but why? Why are you selling your house? You love your house. I love my house. But for the amount that it takes to heat my heat and cool my house during the summer, I could travel Europe for the entire summer. Yeah. Right? So, so people don't think about that. I had one guy, a new home buyer, bought his first house. And he decided that he didn't have the money to maintain his sprinkler system for the internal sprinklers for the house, for the fire safety system. So, and I told him, you're going to have to just do a yearly maintenance. It's a few hundred dollars. It's going to pay you back in space. He never did it, never did it, never did it. One day I get a call and he calls me and he goes, you know, I got a call. I, I'm, I'm out of town. I'm in Spain. So he's in Spain on a, on a month long trip in Spain. Um, and he goes, yeah. So my neighbor called me and said, there's water pouring out of my front door. I'm like, well, that, that doesn't sound good. Sounds like a problem. So yeah. So, uh, the plumber went over and his fire safety system had burst and was flooding his house with about four inches of water. And this was a large house. It was about five, 6,000 square foot house. So can you imagine your lower floor? So you're figuring that's at least 4,000 square feet of the house with four inches of water. That's a lot of water. Yeah. So now your expense of the water, the repairs, the damage to the house, getting, fixing the system itself. I mean, it's, it's a huge cost, but because he didn't feel he had the money to maintain the house and didn't put the money in, it cost him quite a bit of money. A lot of people don't think about um, heating, cooling, just regular maintenance, the, the yard, the pool, termite. You have no idea the number of houses I go to that haven't had a termite inspection in 10 years, which that might not be a big deal where you are, but in LA, every there's termites everywhere. So you need to do regular maintenance. Otherwise, there's going to be a huge bill at the end of that rainbow. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's you know? a good point. So, so building a good team and then understanding the real costs, not not ignoring sleeper costs, is super super important. Nice. Now let's let's flip it. Let's let's. I love okay. to flip things around. What are some common mistakes agents make with you know either selling or, or trying to help a buyer? Okay, so uh, one is not getting to know the buyer mm, because yeah. uh, they say buyers are liars, and that just means buyers don't really know what they want, right? So I remember when I started in real estate, I had a client and they came to me and they said, okay, we want a mid-century, which is a, a style of house. It has to be mid-century, has to have a pool, has to have a pool, non-negotiable, and has to be quiet, right? Quiet. Oh, and single story. Single story, has to be quiet, mid-century, pool, okay? We looked at every house that that fit. Right, just those requirements because those are requirements they gave me. I was yeah. new. I just did what I was told. I do what I'm told. You know, I thought I didn't know better. Right, uh, and finally there was nothing, nothing, nothing. And the house we ended up with, I actually had sent to them by accident. Funny enough, and I just kind of started opening up the searches and sending stuff because I'm like, I don't know, I don't know what to do with them. Right. You know. Um, and they ended up with a house that was uh, three stories, modern, very large, no pool, above the freeway. <laughs> and they loved it. They loved it. They were like, oh, my gosh, this house is perfect. And I said, you know, this house is literally none of the things you described wanting. They said, it doesn't matter. This is everything we want. We want the size. We want the light. We want, oh, this is so ideal. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for finding it. And so what I realized was what I hadn't done 
is really get to know what they wanted. I just listened to their words, yeah. but I didn't get to know what they actually wanted, right? It's about talking about why do you want these things? What is it you're trying to achieve with the house? What's the lifestyle? Because what people undervalue is where they live and what they live in dramatically changes their lifestyle on a daily basis in every mental, physical way you could imagine. Uh, in fact, years ago, I did a research project that was about who uses green space because it's established that is healthy physically and mentally, right? And California specifically is, important, is, is interesting because LA has the largest green space to urban border in the country. So I did a research project about it. And the number one thing, can you imagine, can you guess what it is? Trees. What's that? Trees. That's what I'm thinking. Trees. No, no. The number one thing, it wasn't about if they're healthy or not. It wasn't about if they liked green space. It wasn't about the weather. It was just about access and proximity. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So where you live and what you're close to dramatically changes what you actually do on a daily basis and changes how you think about things. Yeah. It's a whole minimum you, expectation thing, right? We, we, there's, there's two things when you're thinking of when you're purchasing time and money, how much time is it going right. to cost me? How much is it going to cost me? But people undervalue how much this affects my lifestyle. Yeah. So I, I always tell people, instead of thinking about the time and, and the money first or the location, what is the lifestyle you want to achieve? Mm. first? Then we can look at, the money that you're qualified for and how much space you actually need. Yeah. Like, for example, I had one guy and he goes, I want a huge yard. I want a huge yard, giant <laughs> yard. I don't even want to see my neighbor. Nobody neighbors. wants a yard, man. I got a big one. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. But so, but he goes, but I don't want to maintain anything. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's going to be hard. And he goes, and I don't want to spend that much money. I'm like, well, Space is, is, is expensive, especially in cities. So what I did is I kind of created a, a creative hack, which was we bought a house that bordered a park. So his personal yard wasn't that big, but he literally bordered a giant park. So he got all the advantages of a yard smart. with none of the cost. Yeah, smart, smart. So where, where do you, where do you see, let's, let's kind of bring it down to the residential area. Where do you see like yeah. the res, real estate residential going in? Cause you know, the market's kind of crazy right now. Everybody's like 2010 are saying run away from real estate. Where do you see it going? Right. Well, there's a few, few things. Um, and I think this is also something that a lot of agents do wrong, which is they don't really know the market. They don't take the time to learn the trends. And they just are told, sell, sell, sell. Or, you know, you get a lot of agents even who are kind of doomsdayers who are like, oh, everything's going to drop. It's over. You know, which it doesn't help anyone. And uh, so I think the market, you know, you're not going to see the 20% gain you did last year. I think you'll, what you're seeing right now is the prices are still going up slowly, right? I think this year you'll probably see them go up 4% right? If you have a good house right now, it's still going to sell and it's going to sell fast. And it's probably going to sell for a a very good number, right? So that's a great thing. Um, Interest rates are definitely up right now. So either they're going to keep going up or they're going to drop. That part, I am not sure. I think they're going to go up a little bit more uh, for this year uh, because the Fed has said they're going to. Yeah. And, And, you know, next year, We'll have to see what happens because if the war uh, expands, that's going to change the the finances. Yep. If um, you know, if there's another, if there's more pandemic problems where cities shut down again, that's going to create uh, unique issues. If stagflation takes a hold and and is in um, full swing, depending how long that takes, could change the the formula. But I think right now, what's what you're going to definitely see happen is the rental market is about to go crazy. Um, It's going to skyrocket. So right now, money's still cheap. I know it's gone up, you know, I mean, in three, in three months span, it went up, the the cost of your mortgage went up more than 55, 60%. That's true. However, historically, it's still, money's still cheap. Uh, In 1981 or 83, 
I mean, just single digits was seen as, oh my gosh, I don't think that'll ever happen again. I think interest was at 11, 12%. So money's still cheap. I still wouldn't use that as a reason to not buy because if interest rates do go down, you'll just refi. And right. if they keep going up, then you win because you have a low interest rate. Yeah. Right? Uh, a lot of people are not going to sell because they have such low interest rates. What they'll do is they'll rent their house, yep. right? Yep. And if they yeah. do want to move, they'll just buy another one using that rental income to pay for the new house. So I think what you're going to see is still a little bit of a vapor lock where people want to buy on the top end and no one's selling on the bottom end. So while it will be easier and it's taking longer for houses to sell, I don't see a huge jump in inventory coming. Yeah. Now, let's let's meter that though, because like in Calabasas, the inventory went up 50% in a month, but it went up from 12 to 20 houses or 24 houses. And that's an all, a whole city. So it's still nothing, right? If you, so it's kind of like when you look at owning, investing in a house, you can look at two things, the percentage that you're making, but also you have to look at the bigger number, right? So right now the percentage is big. Things are jumping. 60%, 30%, 90%, 80%, right? But the actual numbers are still tiny, right? Right. So it's kind of like when you, when you buy a house and you're like, oh, I'm making a 50% increase. But if you only put in $50,000, you're not making that much money and it's still probably not worth it. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? So right now you could say, oh, interest, you know, your payments went up 66%, which is true, but they're still cheap. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I think what you'll see is right now you're seeing people really scared. And I think a lot of these buyers will come back to the table. So there'll be more buyers. Um, I don't see a big jump in prices. And I think uh, in maybe six months, seven months, either the market will slow down more or it could to the opposite, depending on what all these other factors have to do with. That's a good point. But I don't, what I don't see happening is a 40% drop. Yeah. I don't right? see that. What I don't see happening is a, is a, is a huge real estate led recession because the, the, a lot of people go, well, this is going to be another drop just like the last time, the last time. And I'm like, well, uh, you have to compare apples to apples. Yeah. Yep. And there isn't a last time we didn't have this kind of, world health crisis linked. This is my first uh, pandemic I've been through. (laughs) Right. I mean, unless you live through the twenties, I I missed all the other pandemics. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I don't think you're talking about the last time in 1923, you know, that I think that was the last true world pandemic. So, you know, people are comparing it to a real estate led uh, crisis, which was really a lending, a mortgage and a credit crisis uh, just disguised as a real estate led drop. So people go, well, there was, you know, like dropped overnight, dropped overnight, which is true. However, in most recessions, which I do believe the recession will be uh, announced shortly uh, because it's two quarters of uh, economic shrinkage, which we have that. So, okay. But that doesn't mean it's a real estate led recession or a real estate led crisis. So that's the big difference. Uh, In fact, historically in the last five of six recessions, real estate values went way up Yeah, during the recession. Just, you know, two of them, 91 and 2007, 2008, there was drop. Yeah. But 91, it only went down a little bit and all the others, it went way up. Now, granted right now, you, you they didn't have interest going up at the same time. So that's why I don't see it, it skyrocketing. Yeah no matter what happens because interest rates are uh, dampering the market, but they're doing that on purpose because realistically, if we had 20% gain again, the whole country's in for a major drop. Yeah. Totally. And that's unsustainable. It, just, it doesn't, unsustainable. it's not healthy. It doesn't make sense. I agree. So now there's certain, there's a few secret markets that I think are going to have some trouble, right? Uh, there's 10, 10, but the, the top few are like Austin, Texas, um, North Carolina, Charlotte, yeah, Charlotte, North Carolina, Idaho, yeah, Charlotte, North Carolina, Cape Coral, um, Cape Coral, and a lot of the cities in in on the western side mm-hmm. of uh, Florida, not Sarasota and the bigger ones, but the smaller ones that had massive growth. Yeah, because those cities 
the uh, prices have so far outweighed the um, inflation and wages, wage increase, there's no mathematical way that, that those are going to sustain. Yeah. And like in, in Austin, for example, I was talking to a friend of mine who said, hey, I want to buy this house. It's listed at $800,000. And I said, oh, did you get the house? He goes, no, it just sold. I said, oh, how much did it sell for? $1.7 million, which is almost double the asking price. I said, oh, what, what are, what's the rest of the market? Like, what's the rest of that neighborhood selling for? Ah, 900 maybe a million. I'm like, so wow. in essence, that person literally just bought a $900,000 house yeah. for $1.7 million. They're not setting the new floor. They just overpaid yeah. because they're emotional. Yep. Yeah. Right? So being emotional, both for agents and buyers is, is a problem also. That's a common mistake I see on both sides of that, that coin. Yeah. And to your point, you know, you don't know what the interest rates are going to do. So folks, if you do own the house, Look at the HELOCs right now. Your price of your home may not actually ever be this high again. So it might be a smart idea to kind of lock in one of those HELOCs at a high uh, of, a, of a appraisal of a high appraisal. 5.5% right now, I think is roughly, I think you can probably some, find some, I know I've been looking, I found a 5.5 with uh, 0% down, zero closing. So, I mean, it's like free money. It's free money. And, and you're not going to pay yeah. it unless you, unless you pull out. But to your point, you know, looking at rentals, looking at, um, looking at ways to create generational wealth is important for, for everybody. So, so now is a great opportunity to do so yeah. if you do it right. Yeah. If, if you know what, if you get good, if you build that good team, which is so important, you can build generational wealth for, you know, a couple generations. Yeah, I agree. Please. I agree. So Nate, tell the yep. folks at home, how do they get in contact with you? How do they find you on social? How do they find you on the intro web? Give them some information. How do they contact you? Absolutely. So I am absolutely all over the internet. You Google my name and I should come up, but the best, best, best way is my Instagram at Getzels group, G E T Z E L S G R O U P Getzels group, just like my name. And uh, I will pop up right away. In fact, I think I'm one of the only Getzels on the internet. So I'm definitely <laughs> the only pitch on Getzels in the world, actually fun little fact. The only the only Nathaniel Pitch on Getzels on Earth literally is me. That's uh, nice. my name, so kind of wild. But uh, and I think on Instagram they have my phone number, my email. Perfect. I mean, you can also feel free to share my my of phone course. number in the show notes. Yeah, and um, for those folks listening, sign up for the newsletter. The information will be on the newsletter as well. So please do sign up for that. Yeah, I'm really excited about your newsletter. By the way, I think there's going to be really uh, uh, it's going to be a wealth of great nuggets of, uh, it is, yes. of information there. So I'm really excited about your newsletter. When does that, when does that launch? Every, it, it comes out. I actually start releasing them and they come out every, um, shoot. What is it? Every Wednesday, every, every Wednesday, I believe it is. Or no, every Wednesday. Every, wow. What's it? Yeah. Every Wednesday, a weekly, a weekly newsletter. Terrific. Well, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, but the, yeah, I think even on online, I think they even have my fingerprints, blood type. Nice. Now, you know, <laughs> I think there's a little alert when my, when my toes itch. Yeah. In fact, know. you know what? You said you're in Seattle recently and I, I probably passed by you cause I got a COVID alert. You know, somebody, you, somebody, got the there COVID. you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> my phone was it connected it. with yours. Oh, um, look out. Man, guy's trouble. man, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm definitely going to send you an email to connect you with some other folks on the back end too. Cause I know you mentioned connecting with some folks. So I want to do that. Uh, thank you again sure. so much for your time. I'll, I'll really folks listening at home. Definitely, you know, learn more about the real estate game because it, it does really have an opportunity to create generational wealth. And it, it really is a way for you to kind of create uh, residual income as well. So just a lot of great nuggets. Nate, thank you again so much for uh, taking your time for being on the show. For those listening, please follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and you can subscribe to the newsletter on theshadesofe.com. Thank you. And have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.